It's a little odd, perhaps, to read about Jesus' birth at the beginning of Advent. According to the liturgical calendar, Mary hasn't even been told that she's pregnant with Jesus. And yet, given some things happening in our local community, we wanted to spend this Advent considering the theme of making room at the inn. Making room in our lives for one another. Making room in our hearts for God's love. Making room in our community for folks who have no place to call home and have no place else to go. And so we consider this text from Luke's nativity story. Joseph and Mary, very pregnant with Jesus, have arrived in Bethlehem and they need a place to stay. But in this whole town, would anyone give them shelter? Would you? A reading from Luke, chapter 2. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the end. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. Please pray with me. Everlasting God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations upon all of our hearts serve to glorify you. And may they be in keeping always with the teachings of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. My wife, Angela, has a passion for golden retrievers. When I first wrote this, I'd said she had an obsession with golden retrievers, but when I ran this bit by her, she said, it's not an obsession, it's a passion. So she has a passion for golden retrievers. We got our first dog, Furley, a golden, a little over a year ago, and she was just a few weeks old. I made the trip down to St. Louis at the height of the pandemic to retrieve her because Angela finally made it clear that we were either getting a golden retriever or we were having another baby. (laughs) And that made my mind up pretty quick. She said the same thing about the fish a few years ago. We had to have a fish. But that didn't end so well. After several of them had died, we were left with this grotesque algae eater all alone in the tank lurking around with its tentacled mustache sweeping the rocks for sustenance a very sad excuse for a pet uh, that i ended up donating to a tropical fish store we left the fish tank on the curb uh, for anyone who wanted it but it was stolen by renegade teenagers who dragged it down the street to the park where i found it smashed to pieces i guess you could say they were fishing for trouble I mean, some people will seize any opportunity to cause problems. It's enough to give you a migraine headache. I'm sorry about all the fish puns. I really jumped the shark this time. I'm really floundering up here, guys. Oh, I'm sorry. Anyway, I'm done. For the first... Uh, you know, thing, it was the fish. First it was the fish, now it's the dog. So since we got Furley, our house has exploded with golden retriever paraphernalia and merchandise. Golden retriever sheets and blankets. Golden retriever tablecloth in the dining room with a golden retriever centerpiece. Golden retriever socks, t-shirts, and jewelry. A life-size, wire-framed golden retriever statue in the front yard that lights up when you plug it in. When it came in the mail, I was reminded of that scene from the movie A Christmas Story, you know, where the dad wins some kind of sweepstakes and gets this mysterious crate delivered to the house. And of course, inside he finds this provocative lamp that's shaped like a woman's leg and a fishnet stocking. 
It's beautiful, he says, a sentiment echoed by my wife when she opened up the cardboard box with the fake light-up dog inside. And then there's the framed photograph of Furley sitting at a table and eating Thanksgiving dinner at doggy daycare. The family photos of our kids pushed to one side (laughs) to make room for it. We really struck gold when we found her, Angela says. Now we all love Furley, and I'm glad we could give her a loving home. But my wife has a big heart and a lot of love to give, and that's why she just registered for Golden Retriever Foster Care so that we can take in other homeless dogs who were rescued from abusive situations all over the world. This is a golden opportunity, she tells me. She, does, she really does talk like this. Now, I'm not entirely sure this is a good idea. I think it will be hard on Angela and probably Furley, too, when these dogs get formally adopted, you know, and we have to give them up. And to be honest, part of me is afraid that we're going to be the ones who end up adopting them. And there's only so much room at the proverbial inn. You know, Furley's already taken over the entire first floor of the house where she runs around chewing her toys and chasing her tail and knocking over the rest of us in excitement if we happen to go down there. But maybe, as Angela has taught me, there is always room for one more at the inn. Not so, of course, for Mary and Joseph while traveling to Bethlehem for the Roman census. As we're told, there was no room for them at the inn. As the familiar story goes, everyone in the region was ordered to return to the place of their birth so that they could be uh, more easily counted for tax purposes. That's all the text really tells us about their circumstances. We aren't told how Joseph, a man from Bethlehem, came to be engaged to Mary, who lived in Nazareth. Presumably, their marriage was arranged by their parents, as most unions were in those days. Now, that said, we might also presume that Joseph's parents probably wanted to call the whole thing off once they learned that Mary was pregnant. It was a scandal, a disgrace that I cannot imagine they wanted any part of. You see, I've been wondering why Mary and Joseph were looking to stay at an inn in the first place. If Joseph was from Bethlehem, why not stay with his family while they were in town? One can only presume that Joseph and Mary weren't welcome there, making the trip back to Bethlehem even more unpleasant than we might have already imagined. That might also explain why Joseph moved to Nazareth in the first place, to escape the stigma of his engagement to a pregnant woman. For Mary and Joseph, One could hardly call Bethlehem home. And so, possibly unwelcome at his parents' house, Mary and Joseph seek lodging at the local inn. Now, this was surely a last resort. Inns and taverns were mostly pagan establishments in the first century, generally frowned upon and disdained by Jews for their unwholesome uh, reputation. Ancient Jewish sources, according to one scholarly journal, and I quote, speak of the need to keep one's distance from Gentiles in general, an injunction that would make life difficult for Jewish travelers to avail themselves of the inn's services on a long journey. These were decadent establishments, places for drinking and prostitution and unsavory characters where violence would often erupt. As a wise man once said, You will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. But Joseph and Mary were running out of options. And they were running out of time. Now there's a hotel right here in town with a similar disreputable reputation. I'm not going to mince words. I'm talking about the hotel down on Roosevelt Road near Panfish Park. I've never stayed there myself, but I've only heard bad things about the place. It is, by all accounts, the quintessential Roach Motel, a haven for bedbugs stained with various bodily fluids, dirty, ramshackle, and crime-ridden. Most of the reviews give it one star. One of the more uh, damning reviews declares, 
Blankets have cigarette burns, and the lampshade was cut with scissors. The carpet is so nasty, our feet are black from walking on it. The tub is so gross, it has not been cleaned since I don't know when. Our car was hit, and they refused to run back the security video until they had time. The woman working the front desk calls people junkies and records them and puts it on Facebook for people to laugh at. I'd rather sleep in a dumpster than stay here ever again. Don't waste your money on this disgusting place. That last bit is written in all capital letters for emphasis. Okay, so it ain't the Ritz Carl. And beyond the filth, the place has a reputation for violence and crime. Even so, I would not go out of my way to condemn an establishment like this if it weren't up for sale. You see, the village of Glen Ellen is trying to acquire the property with the help of our organizing partner, DuPage United, to build a rather nice, affordable housing complex on the land. We're working with a nonprofit developer, Full Circle Communities, who already built a similar property in Elgin, which is a beautiful space that blends in well with the neighborhood, providing safe, accessible housing for families who otherwise cannot afford a place to live around here. The idea, the plan, is to find homes for the last few long-term guests of the hotel, tear the place down, and build a safe, supportive community for families who can't otherwise afford to live in Glen Ellen. I don't even live in Glen Ellen, given the high cost of single-family homes and the exorbitant taxes. And I know a lot of older folks have had to leave, too. They've paid off their houses, but the taxes are too much. It's an expensive place to live. And I think our community would benefit from a little economic diversity. I mean, do we really want to lean into our town's reputation as a bourgeois haven for the upper crust? Or rather, our stated ideal as a place for everyone? And if you can't answer that question, I'd redirect your focus to Mary and Joseph. Would they find a home here? Could they find a home here? Even the local inn, no better than the aforementioned hotel, proves to be too luxurious for them. They're told there's no room and sent on their way, forced to find shelter in someone's stable. We don't really know if they were given permission to lodge there or if they simply snuck in and settled into the hay amongst the livestock like any homeless family might do in their hour of need, finding an alley or some other nook to crawl into. My concern with this potential development uh, in our town is that some of the same folks who decry the homeless folks in our streets complaining about panhandling or folks sleeping on benches downtown will be the same to object to affordable housing. Not in my backyard, as the old saying goes. The calculus is simple. I mean, do we want people living on the streets or not? On a similar note, there's another exciting development happening. DuPage pads as you probably know by now, is shifting their focus to more stable housing. Rather than offering shelter for the homeless at local churches, synagogues, and mosques, a service that our church has offered for 35 years, they're in the process of acquiring the Red Roof Inn in Downers Grove, which would become a permanent shelter for folks in transition. Well, this is a bittersweet change for us, given our efforts uh, to provide shelter for so long. I know our, our service to PADS is one of the things that we are most proud of in this church. I think this will be good for the folks that we've been trying to serve. Now they won't have to spend all of their time and energy and what little funds they have getting from one shelter site to another around DuPage County. Now they can dedicate themselves instead to things like case management, job training, and actually escaping from homelessness. And there are actually still a whole lot of volunteer opportunities for us, which you can read about in your weekly online newsletter. We can all be part of the change that we want to see in our community. So this Thanksgiving, this Advent, let's consider what it means to make room for someone. Maybe that means opening your home to a rescue animal. 
Maybe it means volunteering with pads in a new capacity, helping folks who are homeless get by until they can find a place to call home. Maybe it means learning more about this effort to build affordable housing in Glen Ellen. I'd be more than happy to buy any one of you a cup of coffee and tell you all about it. Or you can attend one of our uh, listening sessions in the next couple of weeks, December 5th and 12th, after church, to learn more. Either way, I'd call it a golden opportunity to make a little room at the end. Amen.